Let's start our, our uh, program here today. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us here. We really appreciate it this morning. First and foremost, we want to thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord Jesus, you came as a Lamb of God. You did this, Lord, because you love us more than our sin. You took the wrath upon yourself. You became our sin and died for us on that cross and defeated the power of sin in our lives. And then you walked out of that grave on the third day. What a blessing. You walked out of that grave. You rose from the dead and defeated the power of death in our lives so that we were born again, children of the living God. You defeated sin and death in our lives and made us yours for eternity. We're so thankful. We love you, Lord. And this is the truth. This is the virtual truth. This is the truth that we, we penetrate the world with, the light of Christ. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to start out, and I'm going to go on, and to talk about a few things. I want to tell a little bit about the story about what happened to me in the middle of the night when I was recovering. When I came out, uh, they noticed that my heart rate was racing. My heart rate's usually about 57 to 63 or 4, maybe 65. And, um, but my heart rate was 112, and I had spiked a couple times into AFib. About 10 years ago, I had AFib, and they went in and did the paddles, and they punched me and went away, and I've never come back. I've never had a problem. It, it, it was a unique thing. But this sort of bothered me uh, a little bit. Then I said, well, there's nothing, you know, I just did fine, and they didn't, and the heart rate was running around 112, 110. And I, uh, so we started, I went to sleep, and they said, this happens a lot. And then I was, uh, and then they kept waking me up every hour, and I woke up and was sort of miserable in the hospital, as you know. And I looked over it still, and then the numbers and on the, you know, the heart rate thing. And my blood um, oxygen level was fine, but the heart rate thing was out of control. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, I, I took something down the wrong way, and I started coughing like, <clears throat> you know, really, but really hard, you know, like a sneeze cough, but not, not a sneeze, real hard. And all of a sudden, my heart rate stopped, and I thought, oh, great, this is great. And they weren't in there, and all of a sudden, and I, and I had another coughing fit, and my heart rate dropped to about 48, and <clears throat> And I said, Lord, I don't know what's going on, but I know 48 is not cool. And I start, and then I had to cough again. It went down to 31. And I thought, well, this is not good. This is like, I'm going, to, I'm going to, you know, pretty much I'll pass out. Don't know if I'm going to live or not, but I'll be going, I'll be going under in a moment. And uh, it went up back to 48 and I coughed again and went down and it went up. And all of a sudden it went down to about 30, 31. It stayed there. And I just started praying. I said, Lord, I, I really wasn't praying for healing as much as I said, Lord, if, if this is when you're going to take me, then I'm, I'm just amazed that I don't feel anything, that I'm just so, you know, it wasn't like in a mystical thing, you know, it was just, it was truth. It was vertical truth. I knew I belonged to him. I said, Lord, it, I, it wasn't like I was praying for the kids or my wife, you know, I knew that the Lord would take care of them. I just said, Lord, if this is it, this is what, it's good. This is good. This is good. It's good for me to be here with you, Lord, to know that I belong to you. I had no question in my heart that I belonged to the Lord. And it biffed up a little bit to one of 38 or 39, and then it biffed down, and, and then it just sort of went back up. And it was normal for a minute. I said, well, Lord, thank you. You healed me, and then all of a sudden up to 100 and, 112 or whatever. So the girl comes in. I tell her all about it, and she said, and she said to me, well, you know, you know that thing on your chest with all that stuff? you're all wired in and you have an EKG going all the time and I'm watching all the time. And that one over there is sort of the monitor with your finger and everything. But this is the one that tells you you're going to die. And she said, I've been sitting out there. I've gotten no alerts that you were going down. None. And we went through the whole thing and talked about how people say when you sneeze real hard, you know, they say, God bless you because people believe that when you sneeze, you know, that your heart stops for a moment or whatever. And she said she heard that when she was in the Philippines. She was getting her, her final thing from her lady. She said, that's why people in the United States say, God bless you when you sneeze. And she smiled, I smiled. Anyway, and I've been telling her about the Lord all night and talking to her and praying with her and talking about her kids. So in the morning, um, so I went back to sleep, tried to do this, went to that, and the rate was high. But in the morning when she was about ready to leave at 6, I got to pray with her. And this is the what I wanted to share. More than anything, I wanted to share this. So I prayed for her and I said, it's all about Jesus Christ. I thank you for, you know, this wasn't a big deal to her. She didn't participate in my little thing, but I was praying for her and telling her, I said, I'm going to pray for you because you've been a blessing your children and thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. And, um, and I prayed for her and it's the most wonderful thing I've ever heard because I've prayed for a lot of people in my life. And I've sort of been strange about this too, but she turned around, looked me in the eye and she, and she says, 
I accept your blessing. Wow. I just said, oh my gosh. And then the lady who checked me in and she came in, an older lady, started telling her, you know, we were talking about the Lord and just little things that I do naturally as my conversation. And I started, she said, are you a pastor? And I said, yeah, sort of. I'm, I'm a pastor, a lay pastor, and I do that. Then I started talking about First Love Ministries USA. And, and so she started talking to me a little bit, a little bit there. And so when I was getting ready to go, I put my hand out and I held her in and I prayed for her. And she was so blessed, you know, she wanted to get the thing so she can get online or do whatever. I don't know if she'll show up sometime, but I, at her work, maybe she'll watch the, when we send them out on YouTube, you know, that's a lot. Of, I think a lot of people are doing that, but, and I'm hoping that they are, because I believe that God has put you guys, you guys don't understand how important you are. I know you don't. I, I, I see you guys, Dave, I see you down there. I see you. You guys have no idea, you know, to think of guys that are with us, you know, Glenn Smith, who is the international ministry, and you know what's going on. You know what's happening in the real world out there. You guys that have been around for a time, you guys understand that this is critical. We are here for a purpose. We are the stakes in the ground that God's putting in the ground around the vertical truth. So when the winds and the storms go by, we're on the foundation. And when those winds and storms go by, then I'm available, you're available. So that you can either tell them or refer them to come to the group. That's what we are, guys. You, don't, you have your gifts and I have mine. That's why God puts me here. He puts you there and we can refer to each other. <clears throat> we go back and forth. Uh, Scott and I, Scott Jackson and I are buddies and we know each other for a long time. And Scott, you know, he sort of, he, he responds to me in the beginning, just like everybody else did. You know, the guy a little over here, a little too much this and, you know, a little that or whatever. And Scott knows the guys that I hang around with at the club and, and the guys that are in there. They, they have their own way of defining me. I know that. And um, even the guys who are Christians sometimes just don't want to get too close to Christianity. In other words, we don't want to get too identified with Jesus Christ. That, that is the greatest, it's one of the greatest sins we will ever commit. Not to identify with Christ at every opportunity, every opportunity to identify with Christ. That is the evil one through the horizontal thinking van attacking what you and I both know is right. And that is to have our, our faith. Remember they say, well, I don't, I don't have my faith on my sleeve. I don't walk around. I'm not talking about beating people. I don't walk into people and just lay it on them. You know, I did one time, I guess this guy um, <laughs> in the parking lot, I remember him. I told you the story before. Connie Content, you'll remember him, Scott. Connie Content was an old crabby guy. I mean, from the day he was born. And I know his son, really close, wonderful friend. We played golf and Connie Content would hit the ball maybe 120 yards down the middle. I remember we used to play, you know, and that's, that was his game and, and sort of, but anyway, he was ornery and he knew I was a Christian. So he'd attack me once in a while about that, you know, when we were around or say, and I, I look at him, I say, you know, I, I would just sort of not say anything and just be nice, do whatever I could. Cause I was 26, 28, 27. I wasn't, you know, and then one day I was prob probably been doing the group 20 years or something. And I was probably 40, Five, almost maybe 48, 45. And I'm walking across the parking lot and getting ready to go play golf. And when I'm going to play golf, I'm not about ready to stop in the parking lot and talk to people. I'm, I'm, I'm heading to play golf. And so, but I'm, I'm got, I see Connie content getting in his cars over there. I said, the Lord said, tell Connie that he needs to be, that he needs me. I mean, I said, Lord, I'm not going to go talk to Connie content of all people and tell him he needs to accept you as his Lord and Savior. I'm talking, I'm talking to God now. And I said, you gotta be, you know, I didn't say you gotta be crazy, but I can't, I'm not, I'm not. and you know, that conversation, it's not like God's talking to you like an audible voice, but it sounds, I knew he was talking. I was listening. He was talking. I was listening. I said, Lord, I'm going to play golf. <laughs> you know, who wants to save some guy for eternity? I got to get to the starting time, you know, and I started, I thought, I said, you can't mean this. And he said, I want you to tell him. So I went over like this. Hey, Connie, how you doing, man? He said, oh, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? I said, Connie, I've been thinking about this. And Lord told me, you need to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, you're an old guy. I think he was my age or something. Anyway, you need to know, you need to know him as your Lord and Savior. He looked at me for a minute like he was, then he started laughing. He says, my grandfather back in uh, the old country, he was a pastor and a preacher and all that. And I said, great, your grandfather is in heaven, but that hasn't got a thing to do with you. <laughs> I 
You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He laughed and he said, oh, okay, all right. Got in his car and drove away. Every time I saw Connie for the next 10 years or whatever, every time I looked at him like this with a smile, pointed at him, you need Jesus. And he had, then he got sort of really see He lived to his 92, 94, 96, I don't know, it was a long time. And he'd cripple around and he'd be there with his wife sitting in the corner or something. And every once in a while I go over there when they were sitting there and I'd say, Connie, remember, you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And his wife would look up and smile at me, you know, look at me. And I did that until the day he didn't, he wasn't there anymore. He died. But before he died, he was in a hospital and he was having a hard time. And his family sort of knew Christ and they didn't. And they said they did, but they didn't. But they were all intimidated by Connie because he was, he was a bad guy. He was a tough guy, a tough guy. And he used the money he had and things he had to manipulate people. And um, this is really interesting. I, I'm the only person he let come in to, other than family to come in. And I walked right in. This guy doing the hospital. I looked him straight in the eye and I said, Connie, you need to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Everybody around me, like all the family are going, well, some of them are leaving the door. out the, They're giving out of the room, you know, because you just can't do that, can you? Isn't that insensitive to tell somebody on their dying bed that they need to know Jesus Christ? How insensitive could you be, Don? So, Scott, that's the, uh, the definition of how insensitive I am, as you well know. Scott always reminds me of that every once in a while, like, the point is this, I don't mean that you go in and disrupt somebody or you disrupt a family event or whatever. I had history with Scott. See, if I hadn't have had, listen to me, if I, not Scott, but if I hadn't have had history and what I call, and I call it equity, if I hadn't have been praying for Connie content for 20 years, then I wouldn't have had any spiritual equity. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you pray for someone, I, I'm gonna sometime, hopefully soon, and if you guys would give me a moment here, I forgot to turn the light on behind the, uh, I just noticed how dark I was. But if you guys would think about this for a minute, when you pray for somebody, in my mind, the way I've looked at it over the years, that, that I create spiritual equity. Like David, I've been praying for you, man. That son of yours, you know, the stuff's going on. Just Kyle, praying for you. And you know, I think about all the guys in Gene, my buddy Gene, you know, my 1983 guy, I just love him the most, and I pray for him. I know he's praying for me. And Monty, I've been praying for you, your wife, every day, every day, every day. Because then I have equity. And someday, if something happens and I show up, I'll have equity in your life, you know. And Mike Gee, we know each other forever, and, and now he's back, able to come to the group. And he sent some really nice note to me. That was great. Uh, you guys are very, you know, I, I think a uh, Renee, how we start in our relationship now. It's funny, you told me that we knew each other 25 years ago. You used to try to get in. I was such a big hitter. It was so hard to get in to talk to me. I know I was a pain back then, you know, and now I'm a no hitter and, you know, hopefully we can communicate, right? So God changes things around, doesn't he? And so I think about this and, and Andy not, he knows Andy's a strong guy and he was around watching me when he was a kid in the high school and his, I knew his dad and, you know, I, it's like God just, works us all around. You know, Gene and I, I share with him sometimes my financial situation. And it's like, I can't believe it. And I used to write checks, you know what I mean? It was, and now all of a sudden God, but guess what? I don't want to share it with you right now, but I'm going to do a thing on it. I'm going to start sharing my prayer list. The one I do in the afternoon, the one I do in the morning, then what I pray in the night with my wife in the morning. And I'm going to share with you the various groups and where they are and all that, because guess what? When you do that, when you pray for people and you say, well, that's very rote. I mean, you're doing this. No, I'm doing what Paul did. I'm doing what God told me to do. God told me that these people, you see, because I know Christ. Last night, you know, the night before, it was really cool because I had no trepidation. I knew that I, I knew the Holy Spirit made me, that I'm, I'm in his hands. I'm in his hands. It may not have been that it was critical as I thought it was, but I thought it was. And I was in his hands. Yeah, I just knew it. It wasn't like, like I said, a mystical thing. Oh, no. And then that rolling around on the floor stuff, I, I, none of that. That's not vertical truth in a horizontal storm. Let me say it again. Vertical truth in a horizontal storm is where we are. Now, the reason I don't want to get off this too quickly because I, I have something I want to talk about the nation. 
um, because I am praying for various people, then there's various times like this Connie thing where I came in and told him about the Lord. And he listened for a minute. He sort of softened up, and then he got hard again. And I could see his, his two sons. They were petrified. And yet they smiled because they both knew what I was going to do when I came. Do you know why they knew what I was going to do when I came? Do you know why? They invited me in because they knew I was going to do what I was going to do. I wasn't going to pat him on the back of the head and say, I hope and you seem to be a good guy and you did all these good things because there is no good that you can do that will get you into heaven. I want to say it again. I talked to the, I heard two Christians talking the other day. And one of them said, well, you were born again, you know? And the other guy said, well, I, I think, I, you know. And then he started talking about what it meant to be born again and this and the other thing. And I, I thought, oh my, I wanted to jump in, but I didn't do it. It wasn't appropriate. See, Scott, I know it's not appropriate. So I let these guys sort of wander through what they don't know. One had limited information. Another guy had come up through the spirit led, you know, all the hocus pocus deal. And so he had, he had the, the two, were, but they both had the same truth. They, they were on the truth and they were focused on Christ and to be born again. And so it was fine. It wasn't like they were going to hell or something. So it wasn't like, I just said, they didn't quite have the comfort and the position. And the one guy was talking about, well, you, you should do this and this should happen to you. And over there, let me tell you, the minute that you, the, the minute that Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit touches you and you, and you come to him, now this is the key, and you repent for your, of your sin. You repent of your sin. And you call him Lord, where I mean, I'm going to follow you, and, and I'm going to turn from myself and turn to you. And I trust that your death on the cross and your resurrection defeated the power of death, uh, of, of sin and death in my life. And, you've, and I am a child of living God. That's the moment you're born again. Because no one, literally no one is a Christian who has not been born again. You're born not by your decision, not by the decision of your family or your mother or your father or your grandmother or the priest or the teacher. You were born again because Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, has given you eternal life through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in you, and you are born again, child of the living God. And if you don't understand it and know that, you can't explain that to your children or to your wife or to somebody who's dying on the, on the, on the bed, okay, or dying on the street. It, it just isn't going to happen because there's only one way to be born again, and that is if God himself touches you through his Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1 and 2 explains that clearly. It's called grace and mercy. Number one, he did not destroy you in your sin like you deserve. That's mercy. And number two, he gave you grace by sending Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. And then Jesus rose from the dead, defeating the power of death so that you have eternal life. That is what I was standing on, the truth. I wasn't standing on some experience. Somebody said, well, when did you come to know? Whatever. You know, when I was a little kid, I walked down the thing, and I learned all about Jesus, and I knew Jesus. I know in my heart he was there, but then I sinned, and I went off, and I, and I went off the rails, and I did what I did and where I was. And then one day, <clears throat> it was like for myself, I just said, Lord, I'm, I don't want to run anymore. I don't want to run anymore. He brought Nancy in my life. I love Nancy. I know that I love her. I don't want to hang around with all these other girls anymore. I don't want the women around. I don't want the party around. I just want just I want to go to where you want me to go. And I didn't know exactly where that was. But I looked at Nancy. We talked in the back from my, the last football game I ever played. It was in San Diego in the Shriner game. I'm driving home. I didn't want to go back on the bus. So I took her with the car and we drove. And on the way back, just it was foggy. And back in those old days, coming back from San Diego up to L.A., it was sort of, you know, it was difficult. No seatbelts back then. She's just leaning on my shoulder and we're driving. And I played a football game, and so I was pretty. And I said, you know, I think it's time. I think we need, I think we should get married. And she looked at me. And within one nanosecond, she just was starting to plan the wedding. <laughs> Who's she going to talk? What's she going to do? Where is it going to happen? How's it going to happen? And then I said, before she could get too far onto that, I said, do you know who Jesus is? <laughs> coming from me, talk about Scott coming from the place, you know. You know who Jesus is. You know, I didn't, it wasn't like, hey, we're going to go to a party and we're going to do this, we get that, we're going to party and we're going to do this. No, it's like, do you know who Jesus is? Because I, because we need to put Jesus first and we're going to get married. We need to find out. She's, well, I went to Sunday school and I heard about Jesus and, you know, I sang songs about Jesus. And I said, but we need to talk. We need to, you know, and I was 20 years old. I mean, it wasn't like I was some 
I hadn't been reading my Bible or, but when I was a kid, when I went to a church where they read the Bible and I went in there and listened to every sermon, they don't have the kids listen to sermons anymore. I listened to the sermons. I sat right, they made all the little kids sit right down in front so they couldn't get away with screwing around. Not with their parents, right down in front. First two rows were just a pile of kids. And the preacher would look right down on them. You know, I can right now, if you've tried that today, all the people in the church would go crazy. They'd all be freaked out because we're saying, oh, you're telling those kids about the fear of the Lord. And you tell them about how this guy killed this guy and cut his head off and all the other things. What are you doing? You can, those are little kids. Those little kids need to all, they need to know vertical truth. So when I grew up, I knew there was some vertical truth. I just didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't want everything to do with it. Well, no, not, that's not anything to do with it. I wanted salvation. See, I got the fear of the Lord in my mind. I wanted salvation, but I wanted to do everything myself my own way. And then one day, the, the good thing about it is so exciting, is that then God, and Nancy and I, would, I remember we were driving around, you know, back then, you have a cigarette, you go down to McDonald's, have a cup of coffee, and you hang out, and you think, Hey, that's very domestic, you know. We're we're just really getting to, we're getting the hang of this, right? And I wasn't a big smoker, but that was a big deal, you know. Everybody sat around. This is 1969 and 68, and so uh, and I was a football player, so I didn't smoke and do that kind of stuff that much. I wouldn't have anything to do with drugs and that kind of thing. But I I um, it's funny. I said, you know, we got to find a church right away. And she was like, she wasn't arguing with me. She just like find a church. We can find a church. And so all of a sudden, so we went driving around. And I told you this story before. Went to this church and that church and that church, and they were all good. But, but there wasn't the word. It wasn't like the word of God was not the main thing, right? And I was avoiding this idea because I knew I, I I knew about Baptist church. We didn't. We had a, a a Bible church, so it wasn't Baptist church. But I knew about Baptist church. I'd met enough, you know, those Baptist preachers around every once in a while. Um, I said, okay, honey, we got to go to this one. So we went and found this Baptist church in Alhambra, and this wonderful guy, Dr. Riley, was there. And within a couple of weeks, Nancy, I, I was, we were listening, and, and the Lord said, uh, I, he asked, do you want to accept Christ? You know, I said, would you like to, would you like to walk down? I'll walk down with you. Would you want to accept Christ? Have you? And she said, yes, I would. And so we got up together. We were 21 years old. We had just been married, and we walked down the aisle together. And I knew, I knew at that time, I knew that I knew Christ, but I went down. And we, we prayed with him, and, and she prayed. And the next weekend, we came in the same dunking tank in the back, and we were baptized together right in front of the church. And I remember how all these things happened. And then I, and as I go through my life, things changed, and we went from here, we went to there, and down to Newport and everything. But the reality is that it's God who decides. It's God who's sovereign. It's God who brings things together. And you and I need to accept what he's given us. And when we have... We belong to him, and we have to base all of our thinking. Today's title was to base your thinking on virtual truth so that your faith, your faith and your hope, that you'll have hope. It brings hope. Now, where do you need hope? Tell me. If we were here and you guys were taking a test after all you've heard it, where do you think hope needs to reside in the horizontal world? That's where hope needs to take over. Because see, hope is always, the definition of hope, it's very important to remember this. The definition of hope is that something good is going to happen in the future. Now, once you're in heaven, there's no more hope. You know why? It happens. It's been fulfilled. But the hope part of this faith trip and this faith experience is in the horizontal world, the horizontal nightmare of what's going on where the evil one is trying to control everything and destroy us. So what happens is, our hope has to be focused on the truth of who Christ is. That's that experience I had in the hospital, is I have hope, and that hope is not here, but it's hope for there. So when the storm's there and the rock's there, I can be on the rock because I know I have hope. The storm doesn't go away. The storm is there. It may get worse. It may get worse, and then you die. I saw I was talking about I'm I'm negotiate. I'm a negotiator and that's what I do for a living and I do all kinds of stuff and I'm going to be opening up a, a new program for um, advisory and and referral services and stuff. I'm doing a website. I'm going to tell everybody about it and get going on it. But my 47 years of negotiating and all the deals I've made, thousands of deals, big deals, little deals. There's no deal that's too small and no deal that's too big because my God can handle all of them, every one of them. And one of the exciting things about it 
is in negotiating. I, I, I've been with principals, guys are worth a half a billion dollars. Another guy over here is worth a couple hundred million and they got their attorneys and they're all going back and forth and they're all trying to get this, and they're doing that. And then, and one of them's madder than hell at me. And he said, how could you ever bring me into a meeting with that guy? That guy I sued that guy five, 10 years ago. I hate him. And I said, well, it's a deal. If you want the deal, you know, we could talk together and go in there and they're, and they come in there and they're madder than hell at each other to start with. Now my, my junior back, this is the old days when I had my runners and stuff with me and they would be a little, you know, be very nervous. And the other guys were this, but that's when I was teaching the word of God, as you know, and I go in the door and I would say to the, uh, and the brokers and the attorneys and everything. And I'd say, well, what's the worst thing? And I just say this to one guy, a younger guy, what I was teaching them. I'd say, what's the worst thing that could happen in this meeting? Yeah. The guy's thinking they'll get up and start yelling at each other. They won't make the deal. And da, da, da. the worst thing I said that can happen in this meeting is one of those guys are going to get so upset. He's going to pull a gun out and he's going to shoot me right in the head. That's the worst thing that's going to happen. That's the worst thing that can happen. Now, if I'm willing to handle the worst thing, can I go in there without being nervous and negotiate between these two people that obviously hate each other, but we're trying to make a deal and get a commission? You think I can't go in there if I know that I'm going to be with the Lord and I'll be okay? And I have, I've told that story many times to various people at various times going into meetings and things that are impossible or whatever conference calls that are impossible. And they said, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? And they can't figure, it's really interesting when you put the worst thing forward and you say, that's okay, we can handle that. You know what ends up happening? I, I got to tell this story. I know I'm off on the thing, but it's so cool. Here's the worst thing. This is what's funny. Guys do this negotiation. The attorneys are there. They're screaming and yelling at each other. They're cussing each other out and they're pointing at each other and they walk out and say, I'll never do a deal. And they walk out the door and they're just, and so I'm sitting there with a couple brokers and those guys are going, oh man, this is, you know, we're in deep trouble. This thing's done and over. They spent two and a half years on this and it's dead. It's gone. Then I've had deals where we all got together, had a meeting. Everybody was happy. Everybody knew each other. They all went to college together, shake hands. Then when I have dinner together with their wives, they think, oh, this is a great deal. I like the terms. Everything's fine and dandy. We leave the meeting and they leave. Which one do you think closed? The one that God wanted? I'm telling you, many, many, many times I've had deals where everybody said everything's fine. They release a million dollars as non-refundable to this, and they don't close. Million dollar commission, doesn't happen. Then I have a deal where they go through the whole deal and they hate each other all the way to the very end. They're doing everything, and it closes, and I get a big check. How did that happen? It wasn't me. It was just that I was having hope in the middle of a nightmare storm. I was just trusting God to continue to do what I'm supposed to do one day at a time. I'm, I'm mentoring a young fellow now, young, he's 50, who is working and things are getting better and they're going along, but he's so discouraged and he gets so negative and, and negative things come out of his, well, this went wrong and then this went wrong. and Oh, and on top of that, this, I said, did you know that it, there's some verse in the Bible and a friend of mine, uh, Gene, he loves this one. It says this. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let me say it again. Rejoice always. How could you rejoice if all hell's breaking loose in the horizontal world? Rejoice always, and pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We're going to close with this. So listen. The, the title of this message was to vertical thinking, okay, will give you the hope you need, will we'll increase your hope and bring hope in the horizontal mess you're in, okay? Now listen carefully. Why would you rejoice always when everything's going wrong and the worst thing that could happen is going to happen and you're going to, like in the middle of the night, the other night, what's the worst thing? dropping down below 30, I'm going to lose consciousness. And if they don't get in here, I'm out of here. I'm on my way to heaven. That's the worst thing. Got it? Worst thing. Do you, you hear this uh, terrible thing, this uh, Elvis Presley's grandson committed suicide. And it said he used a shotgun. And the people, oh my gosh, a shotgun. I mean, it's terrible what happened. But he used a shotgun. Would it have made any difference if he used a 45? Would, what do you think? Would it hurt any less or any more? Would you not be as dead? Whatever. You understand, 
the worst thing that can happen is that you would die and go into eternity without the blood of Jesus Christ covering your sin. You understand that? That's the worst thing. So if you know, if you know that no matter what happens, the next deal, the next meeting you're in, driving down the street, the car starts swerving across the freeway and there's a big truck, man, the worst thing that can happen is that you're with Christ for eternity and you're just rejoicing and saying, why did it take so long for me to get here? That's your worst case scenario. Then I think you can rejoice and be thankful. Rejoice. Rejoice and pray continually. That means just have an open communication with God. A lot of people never could figure that out in the old. Remember, I can't pray all the time. I'm going to say, no. Prayer is an open. It's like when I'm driving down the street, sometimes I'll have a phone call going and I forget it's on. I hang up. I think I hung up, right? Or the other guy didn't hang up. And so we're still connected and we're driving down. I can hear the other person start whistling. And then there's something like that. It's usually my brother's saying, hey, Mike, are you still there? They go, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm still here. That's it. That's what it is. That's what it means to pray continually. You never shut it off. You don't push the button and say, okay, God, I'm done with you now. I did my God stuff, and I'm done. I did the Bible study with Don, and I prayed like he said. I, I prayed this morning, and I read your Bible, and then click, we're done. And I, by the way, I'll check in again maybe noon. I'll be a really religious guy, and I'll come in, maybe t say a few words at noon, and then I'll say something with my wife, and I'm done. I click, I'm off, click, I'm off, click, I'm off. That's how people are doing it. That's why this, that's why this group, that's why this message is given. That's why we're here at First Love Ministries USA to remember that what your first love is, is the most important thing. If you read the book of Revelation, you'll find you call yourself a Christian and you're not hooked up, you're in deep trouble because Jesus is going to come down someday and say, I knew you, but I don't know you. And they're going to say, oh, I did all this Christian stuff and everything, but we weren't connected. I don't know you. That's not a good thing to hear from Jesus Christ. So that's what it means to take the fear of the Lord to feed your faith so that then you can base the vertical truth so that your hope can grow in the midst of all the problems so that you can say, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Because like I told you before, I've been in meetings where they blew up and everybody, so I, I just say, thank you, Lord, that we had the meeting. Thank you that you're in control. But this is the key, listen, sovereignty. I can thank God that he's sovereign in all things. And his, his providential hand from eternity past has already worked everything out on how my life's going to be. He knows every deal I was going to make. He knows who I was going to marry. He knows who my children were going to be. He knows the day I'm going to be here. He knows the day I'm going to go to be with him. Praise God. It's all, it's booked. He's taking care of everything. Vertical truth in the mess where nobody knows anything. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. I know what's going to happen next. Jesus Christ is coming back, and I'm going to be with him. That's it. Joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Romans 12, 12. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. I'm giving thanks because I belong to Jesus, and he's sovereign. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, 16 uh, through 18. Now, listen. We got to go. We're late. I'm sorry. It's 8.08. And some of you guys are, you know, I know how important it is for the world. I had all this stuff I was going to go through. Didn't get there because guess what? It's more important for us to be thinking about how we handle the circumstances in our life. And this is the key. And how we pray for the people around us so that when they need you, you can step up. Now, listen carefully. This is really a little bit exciting. I want you to get it. So you can step up and be Jesus Christ to them at the moment they need Jesus. That's how it works. You be Jesus to somebody today. You pray for these people. You get equity in their life so that when things come up, are coming on apart in their lives, you can walk in, no matter what the rules of the office say, whatever, you can walk in and very peacefully and wonderfully tell them about Christ and about what it means and how you, you know, and that they can pray and that they can know the Lord and you'll pray for them. I tell people, I'll pray for you. I actually do pray for them. Did you know that? I pray for them right that minute and I pray for them and then the Lord puts them on my heart. Just like we're praying for Gary, Stacy's wife, you know, Terry and, and, and Patrick. You got to pray for Patrick and his, his heart. He needs, we, we, we've got to pray for Patrick. We pray for John for the healing of his foot so that he can go back to the villages. We need the funds to go back. 
you know, you need to pray, you need to read the emails and pray for me. It's very hard for me to read, to send those emails out without, without Christ encouraging me to send them because who am I sending them to? And I, I pray that people would not have them spammed and I pray that people would just read them and pray. Just read them and pray. You could pray. And co- I'm not going to cost you anything to pray. You pray for those people. Pray for what's going on. You are First Love Ministries USA. I just got uh, Milan is on here right now from um, Nepal, and he has two really wonderful brothers in Christ. They're the old Campus Crusade team. One's in India, and one is in um, Bangladesh. And guess what? You think we could move on, Gene, to First Love Ministries Bangladesh and First Love Ministries India? I, I don't Think about me. If you ask me, I'd say no. If you ask Christ, Christ in me, the hope of glory, I say yes. But well, how are we going to find, how can we do that? I haven't got a clue. But I know God does. So what is this First Love Ministries USA? People, have, it's just a bunch of guys, a scrappy bunch of guys. I'm lucky to get 30 or 40 of them to show up and talk to me. Well, there's 500 people on the, on the list. Are you, I don't know who's even, who's even looking at the stuff. I'm praying for all the guys so that God would bless your socks off so that you can be joyful givers so that we can do all that we need to do and bring the message that we brought today so that you will have equity in all those people's lives so that we can speak Jesus Christ into their life. Christ, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what it means to be born again. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm born again, child of the living God, and I'm on my way to heaven, and I want you to come with me and everybody you know, okay? That means first wife, second wife, third wife, all the kids in between, the whole, the whole group. Nobody's separated. Nobody. Nobody. Jesus loves everybody. He would not have anyone not come to him. Lord Jesus, thank you for the message today. Thank you for the joy you put in my heart to be here, Lord. All my life, you know, as we've done this men's group, I've always tried to balance vacations, operations, around Wednesday morning, and Lord, you have blessed me for over 35 years, unbelievable thousands of messages, and here we are. All those messages come to this message today, and Lord, yet I know you're going to give us a message next week, and I just pray that the men would take this message when they get the email and pass it on to the YouTube so people can can hear what you've got for us and what it means to have hope. We want everybody to have hope. We want everybody to have Christ in them, the hope of glory. We pray this in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, guys. God bless you. Have a great day. I'm out of here.